Okay, so thank you for this. Welcome to the Bell House uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about the climate, the impacts of climate change on butterflies and moths in the UK. I'm going to draw on the work of quite a few other people as I do so. Um, so it's not all my original work, uh, and I'll try and keep it as as easy and accessible as I can. First of all, on this slide, um, the lovely butterfly was a, on a card given to me by a climate activist who was staying with us. And as a butterfly made out of wild flowers, and she'd obviously put love and care into this. And I thought it illustrated very well how it, the interconnectedness of nature and the fragility of nature. Underneath that, you've got the, what's called warming stripes. This is developed by a professor in Reading, and it's based on the average temperature between 1970 and 2020. And where it's blue, it means it's cooler than the average, uh, and where it's red, it's warmer than the average. And each stripe is one year. So this gives you an indication that. It's as we go from left to right from 1970 towards 2020, it's getting warmer and warmer. And we'll talk a bit more about that as we go through. So I'm gonna cover a little bit about the climate emergency because we're in the middle of the COP. I'm gonna talk about why Lepidoptera, why butterflies and moths are good indicators. And then we'll look at what's happening to their distribution, to the phenology. We'll talk about why averages can be misleading. Uh, and we'll talk about what we can do and the impacts of climate change and draw some conclusions. Um, it's not very often you see comma butterflies mating, but these two were seen um, in Burgess Park and they've been doing quite well as a result of uh, response to climate change. I should say that most of the pictures in the presentation are mine, taken with my mobile phone. Um, and when not, I, I will indicate that. So first of all, the climate emergency and, and some of the stuff I share in these slides has been surprising to people. Um, but what we've seen in the left-hand chart is that carbon dioxide levels have just keep on going up and up and up. And there's no sign of this trend line changing despite the fact we've had 25 prior COPs. And if you look at the numbers at the bottom, the rate of, ch rate of change was about 0.6 parts per million carbon dioxide per year in the 60s, and it was up at 2.3 parts per million per year in 2010 to 2019. So if anything, getting worse. And then on the right-hand chart, which is much more um, expanded from 2016 to 2021 and so, um, the people thought the pandemic might lead to a, a, a blip, uh, a reduction in CO2, and that's just not happened. CO2 levels have continued to go up despite the, all the restrictions of the pandemic. So I think that's another cause for concern. Um, and I think you'll have heard about the IPCC's sixth assessment report come out, came out in August, a physical science basis. Um, I picked out three highlights from this really. First was that it's now unequivocal that human influence is changing the climate and, and causing warming. It's also certain under all scenarios that temperatures will continue to rise until mid-century, whatever we do. So because of the CO2 already in the atmosphere, it's gonna get worse. Uh, and um, UN Secretary General called it a code red for humanity. And we'll see later why restricting to 1.5 degrees is almost unachievable, despite what has been said in COP about keep, keep 1.5 alive. Based on all the pre-COP nas pre nationally determined contributions, the likely warming was predicted to be 2.7 degrees. If all those actions were delivered on time, I think that might've come down to just below two degrees now but it still assumes all the actions are delivered on time and it's still too hot. So cause for concern. And then just to point out, this isn't about the future, this is about the here and the now. Um, two things to highlight that. First of all, uh, um, it's actually um, a, an XR Extinction Rebellion poster handout uh, showing pictures of flooding in London this July. And I was caught in a bit of that where I got absolutely drenched as I was walking around Burgess Park. And on the right hand side, right hand side, you've got the the uh, temperature from the highest ever UK temperature, thirty eight point seven degrees in Cambridge, a couple of years ago, and that's the temperature chart which where it was monitored. So it's here and it's now. It's not something for the future. That's a really important point for us all to remember. So then, why are butterflies and moths good indicators? And I've, I've picked out three three reasons here, and as you can see, this picture of the small skipper on the right hand side. Um, the map shows the range margin of this butterfly and, and, it, and it's present in the southern part of UK, but not in the northern part. So um, 
when species are at their climate range margins, it means they're very sensitive to changes in, in temperature and weather and so on. <clears throat> the butterflies are also cold blooded. So um, they react, react very much to what the temperature is doing outside of them. <clears throat> they also respond quickly. They have high reproductive rates, one, two, or sometimes three um, broods generations per year. The life cycles are short and they disperse quickly so they can get around and respond to changes in habitat and temperature and so on. And really important, they are very well studied. There is a long history of scientific study in this country and we've got a lot of data on the distribution and the abundance of butterflies and moths. And um, I won't go into the detail there, but they, they go back over decades and sometimes hundreds of years and then millions of records available uh, for us to look at. Now we're gonna take a look at distribution changes. So how are butterflies and moths um, responding to changes in the climate? This is a picture of winners and losers on the left-hand side. We've got four winners and on the right hand side, four losers. But I'll talk about some of these in more detail. Um, those of you, um, many of you may have seen the Jersey tiger moth down in the bottom left hand corner here. This was not only known in the Channel Islands and the far southwest of England until about 2007, I think. And then it popped up and it was seen in Forest Hill, South London. Um, and since in the last 10 years, it's really spread very widely. And, and um, in South London, where I am, in Burgess Park, in further south, you see it flying in July and August, a bit like a butterfly, it looks like a butterfly. Um, it's a lovely moth, and it's clearly uh, spreading as a result of the amenable climate and available habitat, because it's caterpillars feed on lots of different things. And that's a story we'll come back to as we go through with other species. Um, now the common butterfly, I showed you the picture of the mating commas at the beginning. This is the, the, the uh, common, this is also in Burgess Park. Um, the map on the, on the right-hand side looks a bit complicated, but it isn't. So the, the darker colored dots are the known distribution in the 70s up until 82. And the orange dots are the distribution known in 2010, 2014. And you can see what's happened. This butterfly, with it, which is at the limits of its range, has spread further north and it's moved at about 11 kilometers a year on average. If you think about the size of this butterfly, which is an inch and a half or so across, uh, maybe two inches, it's, that's an astonishing spread on average for them to be spreading, breeding and moving north. And since this map was created, it's been found right at the very north of, of Scotland um, towards Dunnet Head, the most northern point of the mainland. Um, critical to its success, was that its caterpillars now feed on nettles as well as its other food plants. It historically was known to feed on hop and elm trees. And there was a lot of hop and elm in this part of London. Um, the elms clearly suffered from Dutch elm disease. Um, and that caused a problem for this butterfly. But when it, kind of, when it decided to, uh, it could feed on nettles, it was able to spread much more widely. So a combination of um, temperature and available habitat meant it was a, a winner. And then the ringlet, um, this butterfly you can see in the parks in London. Um, uh, you can see its distribution in the 70s was, was quite limited in the north, but, but uh, 20 years later you can see it spread further. When I was cycling through Cumbria and then through Scotland, this is one of the commonest butterflies I saw in those areas and people were telling me that they didn't they didn't see this butterfly 10 even 10 years ago it wasn't present but it spread really rapidly across the uh, across the country and then the brown argus this is one which is um historically a butterfly you found on chalk grassland caterpillars feeding on rock rows um and if you look at the the purpley dots this essentially picks out the the chalk and limestone geology of England and Wales to some extent. Um, you've got the, the Chilterns and the North Downs, South Downs, the, the Dorset Hills and the Cotswolds and so on. Um, and, but for some reason, uh, the, the butterfly started to, to use geranium species as, as well as rock rose for uh, larval caterpillar food plant. Now it's become much more widespread and it's spread much further north and it continues to spread, to spread north. So. Um, this is one we can see now in London. It wasn't seen in London very much, but
but I found it in Burgess Park and other places um, around the last couple of years. And then the speckled wood. Um, this is a pretty butterfly. Um, likes dappled shade. Lives in lives in wooded areas where there's where there's sunny shaded air, sunny areas as well as shady areas. And you can see it's it's spread north just like the others. Um, but there's a big lag between the the temperature which it would like and its presence. It's responded more slowly than the temperature would suggest, and that's because it the habitat which it would require, which is sort of uh, dappled woodland, isn't so available in parts of the uh, parts of the country. So in, in, in Yorkshire areas, that's not a very common habitat. In Scotland, much more common. So it's kind of jumped across Yorkshire and spread further to Scotland. So things start to get complicated. Uh, and then moths moving north. This is from a survey of nearly 500 larger moth species in, in Britain over the 20 years from 95 to 2016. And um, anything to the right of this line mark zero is a move north. And on average, moths have moved north at, an, at five kilometers per year, 5.1 in fact. Um, the dark green bars are statistically significant and the light green ones aren't. So all the northerly moves are significant pretty much. Um, if you think about an average shift of five kilometers a year, that's, 20, that's 100 kilometers over that 20 year period. So it's quite a big change for a little moth to, to have achieved. <clears throat> and here are four examples of moths where that's happened. These are the footman moths. And, and you can just eyeball the, the maps and show that the new squares, which are the orange ones, are much more widely spread than the blue squares, which are the pre-2000 uh, distribution. So in all these cases, it's spread much more widely across the country. Um, and there's two things going on here because part of it is the warmer climate. But these, the caterpillars of these species all feed on lichen and algae. And um, uh, the cleaner air, the reduction in, in nitrogen oxides in particular, and coal and smutty, smutty um, uh, air quality, uh, means that uh, the lichens are doing much better than they were uh, 20, 30 years ago. And that's been a contributing factor. So once again, it's the necessary, the temperature and the necessary habitat is available, and then you get some, some winners. But it's not all about winners. Um, other species are adapted to cooler, damper climates like this Grey Mountain carpet. And this is massively just decreased in its distribution, 81% um, uh, since the 70s. Um, and it's basically retreating north and it's retreating, retreating to higher altitudes. And it's a real problem for species like this because they end up with nowhere to go and their, their colonies become isolated on the tops of hills and they can't intermix and then the genetic diversity goes down. Similarly, the mountain ringlet, this is our only mountain butterfly in Britain. It, 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 oh, you only see it at altitudes of typically above 450 meters in, in Cumbria and about 350 meters in, in Scotland, where it's cooler anyway. Uh, I, I saw some of these, a few of these, at the Ben Laws Nature Reserve just north of Loch Tay, but I was up at 450 to 600 meters above sea level to do that. Um, um, now on the chart on the left, a little difficult to understand, I think, but basically you can see uh, on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, it's elevation, so higher elevations to the right, and you've got three elevation bands. And then on the vertical axis, you've got how, how what percentage of the area in those bands were where was extinction of the butterfly observed. Uh, and you can see at low altitudes, very high extinction rates, and at high altitudes, lower extinction rates. So this butterfly is moving north, and it's moving to higher, higher ground. And as with the, uh, the moth, you know, at some point it's got nowhere to go. And it's got no, no, there's no strategy which can help it. Now, just a comment on small tortoiseshells. I think most of us remember small tortoiseshells. I think uh, we used to see many more than we used to. We don't see many. The, the small tortoiseshell is a butterfly which spends the winter as an adult butterfly. That's just the peacock on the right-hand side of this chart. Um, and in the spring, the adults come out when it's warm, they mate, lay eggs or nettles, and another generation comes out in, in, in July. But we see reasonable numbers of the spring small tortoise shells, but we don't see many ones in the midsummer anymore. 
And my theory, which is just a theory, is that um, they are cold adapted species uh, and they're escaping from the warmer weather. And when it gets warm, they just go into outhouses or in ivy bushes or somewhere where it's cool and uh, they can shelter down. Because basically all they've got to do from July to March, April is survive, um, uh, eat a little bit of food sometimes and, and, and not get eaten or killed. Uh, and a guy called Malcolm Hull, who's in the, the, the Hertfordshire branch of butterfly conservation, has done a study on this, which you've got a link to there. Um, and he's seen the small tortoiseshells and the peacocks going into hibernation earlier and earlier as the years have gone by. We'll see these peacocks. This was in a, a pillbox on the North Downs, North Downs Way, in August um, a couple of years ago, and coexisting quite happily with a spider. The spider doesn't know the butterfly's there because the butterflies are not moving. Um, but I think that, again, warmer weather means we're not seeing so many of these butterflies in the summer. Um, I, the story I gave about distribution of butterflies kind of indicate and moths kind of indicated that they're spreading and it's all good news. But um, whereas in the past, people used to correlate abundance and distribution and say, well, if things are increasing in distribution, then we've got more of them and the numbers of them are going up as well and vice versa. And what we're seeing now is that um, on this chart, you can see 104 species of moth. Uh, and on the horizontal axis, we've got distribution going from decreasing to increasing. And then on the vertical axis, abundance increasing and decreasing. Um, and we can see that for about a fifth of the species, they're, they're doing okay. The, the distribution is going up and so is the abundance. But for three quarters or four, four fifths of the species really, um, they're decreasing in abundance, even though some of them are increasing distribution. So it sounds a bit can, counterintuitive, um, but it's quite possible for distribution to be increasing, but abundance to be decreasing. And that's what you get on this bottom right-hand corner here. But what's most worrying, I suppose, is that for half these species, they're decreasing in both abundance and distribution. So um, and that's, that's the, if you would think of that as the extinction quadrant, and that will be, um, a result of maybe weather changes, climate changes, but also habitat changes, um, pesticides and, and, and so on, and loss of habitat. Um, but it's a dynamic picture. We think of the our flora and fauna as being static. What we've got here is what we've always had. That's very much not the case. Um, and in the last century or so, over 137 species of moths have become established and 51 have gone extinct. So. Now that's a big, big turnover of, of, um, of uh, our species list. And even in the last 20, 20 years, 53 different species of moth have arrived or come back, um, some naturally and some not. The two, two ones not come back naturally are the box tree moth, which you can see here on the top right, a lovely moth. Um, it's also got a, a form which is almost completely black. Uh, and then below that is a box hedge. It's, well, it was my box hedge before it got completely destroyed. Um, that was imported on box plants from nurseries overseas, um, probably originally from Southeast Asia, but via the Netherlands and places like that. Uh, first seen in Kent about 14 years ago and is now pretty much all over the London area. Similarly, the oak processionary moth, which feeds on caterpillars feed on oak, came across uh, on imported oak stock about 15 years ago and is now well established in parts of London and Southeast England. And uh, that's, a, that's a concern because its caterpillars have hairs which cause a very nasty rash if you get in touch with them. Um, so lots of change. It's not, it's not the static picture which we, we, we kind of brought up to think, think of. And if you then think um, as that the kind of look in our crystal ball for butterflies, um, there, there are some future residents we might have in this country and they may also be re already be resident here now. Um, I'm not quite sure. Picked out three examples, the, the long-tailed blue. Uh, it's seen in increasing numbers. Last year was a very good year for it. A lot seen in Sussex, a few in Surrey, um, and occasionally getting into the London area. Um, but it's caterpillars feed on an everlasting pea. Um, so it, you know, it could easily become established in this country and, and breed here. The large tortoiseshell in the middle is a, is a cousin of the small tortoiseshell. Um, and that used to be a resident here. It went extinct about 40, 50 years ago. Um, and it's regularly seen. Uh, we had a, some sightings down by Croydon this year. 
um, is regularly seen on Portland Bill, and it seems to be breeding there. I'm not certain whether that's a, a natural little colony or whether that's a result of a, some releases of specimens, but it's pretty likely, I think, that that one will become a resident of this country again. And on the right hand side, you've got the southern small white, which looks very much like our own small white butterfly, cabbage white, if you like. Um, this is on the continent, it's been spreading very rapidly. Um, and butterflies and moths will migrate quite happily across the channel. So at some point, I'm pretty certain that butterfly will get across the channel and it will be uh, uh, present here and then it will become established. So I think we've got more changes to come as our climate continues to change. And as I indicated, it will continue to do so. Now we're coming on to some phenology changes, and phenology is about the timing of when things happen in the in, in the country's calendar. Um, and just to start with a picture on the right, many of you will know Cannon Hill Common down in the um, uh, southern part of Merton Borough. Um, this was a ripe blackberry on the 1st of July last year. I've never seen blackberries this early, but normally in July, the bramble is in full flower and it's, it's full of insects, butterflies, bees, hoverflies, etc. Uh, but by the time we got to July last year, there were no no blackberries, no bramble flowers left. And it's worrying that that could be getting out of sync with the butterfly and moth and species and other insects which rely on those brambles for for nectar and pollen. But I'll talk in in this section about London's London's urban heat island effect. I'll talk about the Nature's Calendar initiative set up by the Wooden Trust. I'll talk about moths flying earlier and later. We'll draw some differences between single generation and multi-generation species and talk about the risks of trying to, to, to squeeze in an extra, an extra generation and what happens when that might fail. <clears throat> so first of all, London's urban heat island effect. I think those of us living in London will be familiar with this. The chart on the left shows the GLA area. Um, and obviously redder is warmer. And you can see the difference between central parts of London and somewhere like High Wycombe, which that top, top left hand is, is as much as 10 degrees here. Um, <clears throat> and you can, this chart makes sense because you've got places like Richmond Park and Hampstead Heath showing up as cooler uh, than other parts. And this isn't just, this is a daytime picture from a while ago, but it isn't just during the day, it's during the night as well. And I think probably this, the effects are maybe bigger in the night than they are in daytime for us in London. Um, and this is what part on the right hand side, what passed for cold night in London last year. Uh, in my garden in Lambeth, I think we had six nights below zero and the coldest I recorded was about minus two. Um, and this was minus one. And then on this night in Aviemore, I think it was minus 19 in Scotland. So really big differences in temperature. This means London has a, has a, has a climate almost li like no other part of the country. Nature's calendar is worth a look. If you haven't looked at it before, as I said, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a citizen science initiative led by the Woodland Trust with the UK uh, Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, CEH. Um, and the website, website link is there. Um, and basically what it asks people to do is to record the earliest date of events happening in, the, in, nature's, in nature's calendar. So when buds burst, the first leaf, first insects, when you cut your lawn the first time, all that sort of thing. And the, the datum here, the benchmark here is 2001. And if it's a negative number, it means something happened earlier than the, date, the, the benchmark year. And positive numbers mean later. And what you can see from this chart, just giving a quick look, is that for most thing, most events, uh, the, they're happening earlier now than they were in 2001. And they're happening more early in 2020 versus 2018. So, Nature is responding to the changing climate very quickly, even though we, we, we don't notice it sometimes. So this changes what butterflies and moths actually do. Two species of moth here, which you can see. The gray birch has moved its flight period. The, the, the darker bars, narrower bars are the, are the newer ones. Um, uh, about a week earlier, um, uh, maybe two weeks earlier than it used to be, this peak flight period. And the sharp angled peacock, uh, it had kind of one generation before. It's now got two generations very clearly separated. And the first generation has moved earlier and the second generation has become more abundant. So in this short time, the, the um, insects are changing their behavior. Uh, moths that like to fly later in the year 
flying in August and September, because the, the temperatures are warmer later in the year, they're now flying later than they used to rather than earlier. So this one, the pink barred sallow is now at least seven days later than it used to be. Um, and so these, these effects are quite marked. And if you, this book, the Atlas of Britain's, Britain Islands Larger, Larger Moths, published by Butterfly Conservation last year, is, has got a lot of data on it. It shows a lot of information here. And these changes are pretty statistically robust now. Uh, this is a complicated slide, which I'll try and explain to you, but it, it talks about, uh, I'll use the word univoltine and multivoltine, and that just means one generation or two generations per year. And two different blues, the silver studded blue and the small blue. Now, the silver studded blue just has one generation per year. And you can see there's a peak of its um, abundance uh, during, during June time. It's, it's got an adv advancing phenology trend. So it's the day of emergence is getting early. You can see that in the middle chart on the left-hand side. Um, but it's also then got a declining abundance. So it's actually got a retracting range as well. The small blue has two generations a year. You can see the second generation here comes out this May and, and sort of August time. Um, it's also got an advancing phenology. So the charts on phenology in the middle look pretty similar, but it's actually increasing its abundance trend. Um, and expanding its range. And what people think, this is the guy, Callum McGregor, who did this um, research. He actually joined me from my bike ride for a day when we went to see Silver Studded Blues in Preteeth Common in Shropshire, which is a wonderful day. Um, he, his theory is that the, the second brood is larger with the small blue, and this allows a greater survival rate of individuals through to the next year, and then it allows it to, to recover. So the changes get quite subtle, and, and the species are, uh, are reacting in different ways. Um, then the wall brown butterfly. Um, I showed a picture of this at the bit earlier, early in the beginning of the presentation. It's a it's a brown and dark brown sort of mottled um, appearance. It used to be seen very commonly on farmlands and everywhere across the country. Um, and but you can see the the empty blue circles are where it used to be. In, in the 90s and earlier than that, and it's now absent. It's, it's become extinct over a huge part of central, in, central southern England, um, and now limited mostly to the coastal areas in the north um, and right down here in the south. Um, and you can see distribution abundance both massively down compared with 1976. And the theory on that um, is what's called the developmental trap. This is, a, you can see that this is what the butterfly looks like. This is some work done by Hans van Dijk and others in the Netherlands. Um, and the point about this butterfly is it, 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 it over spends the winter, overwinters as a caterpillar, as a larva. Now, caterpillars shed their skin as they grow, and those are called instars. But it needs to get to the third instar to shed its skin um, twice, three times before it can get to a stage where it can overwinter successfully and go into what's called larval diapause. And in the cooler part, cooler areas like in the north, it does that successfully after two, two generations. In warmer areas, let's say in the south, it can fit in a third generation, get to the right stage of caterpillar growth, and then go into hibernation. But in between those two extremes, it can get to, uh, the caterpillars don't get to the, the right stage, um, and they can't then overwinter successfully. So the, you end up with a lost generation here, uh, which means that the, the, these populations really struggle. So being halfway warm enough isn't good enough. Uh, and the butterflies don't know that it's not, they're not going to be able to get, get to the right stage before they can overwinter. And this could be due to the food plant not being available or it turning cold or whatever reason. I mean, it's quite complicated, I suspect. Um, now we're going to talk about why averages are not, the, not always important not always the most important thing. And this is just an image from a front cover of a, of a book, um, which I thought showed quite interestingly the difference in temperature between uh, grassy areas where the long grass is dark blue and other areas where there's bare ground where it's pretty warm. So you end up with microclimates, um, but also extreme weather events rather than average temperatures and then how butterflies regulate their temperature. So a, a few points here, why the averages are not always important. Um, this, uh, and this is intuitively obvious to us, I think, when we, when we start to, to think about it. Um, this is a reserve called Hutchinson's Bank, south of Croydon. It's probably one of the best 
nature reserves in London. It's certainly got probably the highest species count of butterflies of any reserve in London. And it's pretty good for flowers and, and, and other things as well. Um, it's managed by the London Wildlife Trust. But you can see all these, all these different areas where the, the ambient air temperature is one thing, which is what we measure. But the temperature in the short sward versus the grassy tussocks, tussocks will be different. Bare ground like this will be a lot warmer. This was an artificially created scrape of bare ground to create warm microclimates, which butterflies like. Scrubby areas will be cooler. Sheltered areas will be different temperatures is open and so on. This is a south facing bank, so it gets pretty warm uh, in the summer and it's quite well, quite well um, sheltered as well. So massive differences there, which we, we don't, we kind of know it happens, but we don't think about it very much. And we don't think about what, how insects respond to that. But one study here, this was done by um, uh, people a few years ago, <clears throat> looking at part of Sussex. And just to orientate you with dimensions, this is a one kilometer bar here. So this is something like 10 or kilometers or so. <clears throat> and we're looking at 1982 and 2000 on the same area. The, the point about the silver spotted skipper, which is a small brown butterfly, um, it only really flies above 25 degrees C. Um, and if it can't find that, that temperature, then it won't fly, won't be able to mate and reproduce and, uh, and, and survive. What these researchers did was they modeled uh, using thermal imagery and, and, and all sorts of technical uh, uh, wizardry, um, the thermal quality of habitat areas at five meter resolution. So the habitat areas they studied are these colored blocks and the, the colors indicate how many hours there were in the summer above 25 degrees C in these areas. You see in 1982, there weren't many, uh, the number of hours is quite low, it's quite blue picture. And only in these couple of areas here with the, blue, with the dark outline, bold outline, where the, was the butterfly found. Fast forward to 2000, you can see that the color map is more, more yellow and orange than it used to be. And that the butterfly is spread and is present in lots more of these, these areas here. So um, the changes in microclimate are much bigger than the changes in average temperature. And this has enabled the butterfly to move and expand from a, uh, a refuge population here to quite a large area and be found much more widely. So we can see things like that happening with other species as well. And this is another complicated chart, so I apologize for that in advance, but this is looking at climate climatic extremes, so heat, heat and cold in particular here. And to keep it simple, just focus on the two things um, highlighted with the red um, circles. Um, this is for adults and hibernating adults, and it's showing a positive impact going up and a negative impact going down, and it shows the numbers of species affected um, by the size of the bar. Um, and first we'll look at extreme heat, the black boxes, black coloring, so for, for adults, when it gets extremely hot, that's quite been seen to be quite good news. But when they're hibernating, that's bad news. So hotter temperatures for hibernating adults is not good. Similarly, extreme cold events, bad for adults, but good for hibernators. Hibernators like uh, to have it cold because then probably they're not tempted to, to leave hibernation and then die when it gets a cold snap. And probably it's not so good for predators. So you can see, a lot of studies here and, and how it gets quickly gets complicated um, uh, as you get into details of which life stage of the, of, is affected by what sort of changes. Um, now, now talking a little bit about droughts, um, I guess people remember 1976, the big drought then, I remember it, I was at school at the time, only ended when they appointed a minister for drought, right, a week later, I remember it raining very heavily. Um, and then 95, another drought. And you can see these, these rainfall charts here. These are real outliers at the, at the lower end of droughts. But butterflies and other insects really struggle to cope with this. And you can see this, this is an abundance index of, of multiple species and, um, and years on the, the horizontal axis. Uh, uh, the, the drop in abundance of over half in the year after the drought of 76. And you can see that those habitat specialists who've got particular requirements for for the caterpillars mainly, um, really struggled, never really recovered. And those less picky species, which get called wider countryside species, seem to recover better. And here, it's 19, in effect, in 95, these three species here, the ringlet, green vein, right, and the large right, all suffered 
by at least by around 50% um, the following year because of the drought in 95. So really big effects. The insects really can't cope with these extremes. Um, and then, then we've got the complicating factors of being a specialist. Um, this high brown fertility is very much a, uh, a specialist. This was in Cumbria this summer. Um, these, the caterpillars of this butterfly uh, like to bask on bracken leaf litter in a very warm microclimate. And what's happening in this part of Cumbria is the nitrogen deposition to the, from the sky is increasing. This, the land is getting more fertile and you're getting more grass in the undergrowth below the bracken and then it's too cool for the caterpillars to survive. So you've got complicated interactions between climate change and land use change, whether that's habitat loss or nitrogen deposition. Um, and that is affecting the butterfly and moth biodiversity in positive and negative ways. The outcome, there's a couple of papers here which you could refer to, but the outcome seems to be that you end up in general with fewer species, so more species suffer uh, than not. But the species you're left with are dominated by the ones which are more mobile and which are habitat generous, i.e. they're not so picky in terms of what they require as a butterfly or as a, or as a, or as a caterpillar in particular. Um, now just a, a chart on, on how butterflies can sometimes do something to uh, regulate their temperature. Um, and three different, you, you'll be familiar with different butterflies sitting in different ways. The, so the, the, the red admirals and a few others listed there uh, will bask their wings flat open and they're trying to absorb as much of the sun's rays as they can, like big solar panels. Um, and they mostly dark colored, so they absorb the, the, the rays from the sun. On the other hand, on the right hand side, we've got the white butterflies, which tend to sit with their ring, wings at an angle. And then we think that they're reflecting the sun's rays onto like a solar collector onto their bodies as this kind of concentrating effect. And some others like this small heath always sit with the wings shut and will then orientate themselves so they're perpendicular to the sun's rays. So they, they, they can do things to, to take more or less of the sun's heat depending on, on uh, um, what they need. And some butterflies like the painted lady here can shiver their wing muscles to warm up their bodies. Um, they're, not, they're not actually um, trying to fly, they're just trying to warm themselves up. But this enables them to fly at pretty low temperatures even when the sun's obscured. But if you're a migrant like this species is really, really important. <clears throat> now, just to finish, um, a couple of comments on CO2 emissions and what we can do. And um, the first big slide here talks about why one and a half degrees is such a challenge for us to keep to, why keeping 1.5 alive is such a challenge. And this talks about the, really the supply side. Where, where does energy come from? Where does CO2 actually come from by primary source? And this is taken by uh, a blog from Shell by uh, a guy called David Hone, who is the climate change advisor for Shell, has been for 15 years or so, I think. If you look here, um, talking about the gigatons of CO2, it doesn't matter what the unit is, but the amount of CO2 emitted per year. And majority of it comes from fossil fuels, which is why it's so important to keep it in the ground, as they say. Uh, then about a tenth of that amount from calcination of limestone for cement, very difficult to get rid of. And then another, um, another amount from land use change and deforestation. So that's where the primary source is coming from. But what he's calculated and he's reporting on um, is that uh, the remaining carbon budget, so the amount of carbon we can still emit to have a 50-50 chance of staying below 1.5 degrees C heating is about 400 gigatons. And so don't worry about the unit, just remember 400. Um, and remember that's a 50-50 chance. Um, uh, if our global emissions are about 42, pretty easy to work out, that's about 10 years. So if we, if we want to keep below 1.5, we need to get to net zero by the end of this decade, which is why action now is so, so vitally important. Uh, then this is uh, 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 some information from carbon.place, which is um, a website which was shown to us by Jeremy Brackpool when he did a presentation a few weeks ago on uh, what we can do about um, responding to climate change. And, and it, this is a, a, a snip from the map. It basically looks at the carbon footprint uh, for local areas down to about a neighborhood of a few thousand households and looks at the grades them from very good to very bad. Um, and it looks at the carbon, carbon emissions, or carbon um, uh, footprint 
from five five um, routes: consumption of goods and services, flights, driving of cars and vans, gas and other heating, and then electricity. And I took Dulwich, SW9, where I am, and Dorking as three randomly, almost randomly chosen examples. But the important thing here is that more than half of the footprint, the, the, the driver of the carbon emissions, is from thing, our consumption of goods and services. So what we do actually has a very big effect on how much CO2 there is being emitted out there. And that's counterintuitive. It's not what we're told by governments and other people. Um, and this is a, another chart, kind of blended chart, from actually from Bill Gates's book, How to Avoid a Climate Crisis showing the source of, of greenhouse gases. And you can see electricity making things, keeping warm and cool, getting around and growing things. And it's, it's, it's a kind of blended picture between, between the two ones we've just seen. So if, if we, what we basically need to do is to tackle all sources of greenhouse gas. And that means everyone, um, and by everyone, I mean um, individuals, companies, and governments doing as much as possible, doing it as soon as possible, and doing it everywhere, so not just in China or USA, but but everywhere across the globe, attacking both the supply side and the demand side. Um, and I think the point that comes through is that um, the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, which I haven't talked about, are two sides of the same coin. So you we can't tackle one without tackling the other. And as an example, intensive agriculture being bad for biodiversity, bad for CO two, and this is the two thirds of the UK's land is farmed, a third for crops and a third for um, animals. Um, and it's a very small amount of the UK's GDP, but causes a very significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a lot we have to do. I'm not blaming pharmacy, it's not their fault. But there's a lot we have to do. Um, and I, you will have heard of the Das Gupta review, a review commissioned by the government. A final, final report came out in February. And Professor Das Gupta, who's at Cambridge, said that our economies are embedded with nature, not external to it, which is the assumption we've been making, and that our demands on nature are far exceeding its capacity, um, and that endangers future generations. And that GDP is a very bad measure of economic success. We need to move away from that. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm reminded here of a, of a quote or a, a comment by Dave Goulson, the bumblebee expert, and he said that, um, Parents will do almost anything for their children except bequeath them a planet that's safe to live on. And I think that's so true. So just in conclusion now, um, it's hotter, there are more droughts, more floods, and that's happening now. I said, it's, I've shown you it's a complex picture with rivals, extinctions, expansions, contractions, effects of land use changes, combining with, with climate, positively, negatively. We've seen phenology being important. We've seen it, different effects on whether it's a, a caterpillar or, or an adult or a hibernating adult of the butterflies and moths. We've seen how microclimates, microhabitats are important and how extreme weather events are also very significant in, in the effects. And then that last point there, I think, is most significant for us right now because the temperature will change gradually, but we're seeing many more extreme weather events. We've had floods and droughts and heat waves like we haven't seen before. And the outcome is probably fewer species overall dominated by mobile and, and widespread generalists. And here's a quote from a magazine, Butterfly Magazine, published by Butterfly Conservation, that uh, the impacts of climate change are rapid, varied, and unpredictable. So we need to do everything we can to limit climate change. Um, this chart references some of the, and acknowledges some of the people I've taken um, examples from. Two in particular, Richard Fox's presentation from last year's uh, Butterfly Conservation AGM, which is available on YouTube. And Marcus Rhodes, who's at University of Exeter, did an excellent presentation um, called Some Like It Hot, which again is available on YouTube. And just to um, highlight my bike for butterflies, we talked about this as we were setting the tour, setting the session up, but I did a sponsored ride from Land's End to John O'Groats in the summer and 1,200 miles. Um, I stopped off as many nature reserves as possible. That was to raise publicity. Um, it was to raise money for butterfly conservation. And so far, I think 33,000 pounds or so on. I'm not quite sure. And there's gift aid on top of that. People can still give using this, this link or we'll go through the, the, the butterfly, uh, Bike for Butterflies um, website there. And that's me and John Groats looking a bit tired and thin. 
and that's it thank you very much thank you for your attention um i will stop share now and we can get into the q a